today. Excuse me. And uh, the first item um, on the order paper is member statements. So, if members wish to be called to make a statement, they should do so by raising their places. And again, those members who are called will have up to three minutes uh, to make their statement. I would again remind members that interventions are not permitted, and there will be no points of order on this or any other matter until this item of business is finished. The first uh, member is Danny Baker. Um, I would like to welcome the fantastic news that enabling work will begin in Casement Park this week. This is a positive step to developing a first-class, state-of-the-art sporting facility for Ulster Gales. Casement Park will be a real economic driver for West Belfast, creating jobs and hosting thousands of people when visiting the city to attend games. And the news has created a real buzz uh, in my own house. My children have played Gaelic football, hurling camogie um, with Rossa, the best club in Belfast, should I add, uh, since baby fundamentals. Uh, they have never known Casement, and like all young Gales, they can't wait to not only watch games, but to participate um, in, in playing themselves and winning championship for their respective clubs in Casement. And to think that a major soccer tournament will be hosted in Casement in just a few years is beyond many people's wildest dreams. I was very lucky to experience a great Irish soccer moment in 2016 when I was in France to witness Ireland beat Italy at 1-0 to progress to the next stage. It was a Robbie Brady 85th minute goal. And it was not just the atmosphere inside the stadium, but outside of the stadium that made it special. And we all have this to look forward to. But it is important that the Irish and British governments and the executive continue to work with football associations and the GAA to get this flagship uh, project over the line quickly and on time. Gormel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, a critical issue that is uh, significantly impacting families in West Trone and across uh, Northern Ireland is the soaring costs of home and car insurance. I'm sure many members of this House have heard from constituents that are outraged, particularly those uh, who have not had a previous claim, yet their insurance is going through the roof. Recent reports have shown a disturbing trend of insurance premiums skyrocketing, placing an immense financial burden on many households. Many families are struggling to comprehend the substantial increases uh, they are facing in their insurance costs, with some seeing their premiums rise by hundreds of pounds compared to the previous year. The cost of living crisis and inflation are already squeezing wallets, and these exorbitant insurance hikes only add to the financial strain experienced by ordinary people in our constituencies. In my role as an advocate for West Tyrone, I have witnessed firsthand the distress and frustration of individuals grappling with these unjustifiable cost escalations. While energy companies and corporations enjoy significant profits, it is the ordinary citizens who we represent who bear the brunt of these escalating costs. From insurance premiums to heating bills and grocery costs, it is imperative that the Economy Minister and Finance Minister and the Executive indeed uh, intervene to ensure that uh, insurance co customers are not unfairly exploited. I urge those facing difficulties in meeting these escalating insurance costs uh, to be informed about their rights and to explore the different options to secure the best possible deal. But it is crucial to remember that insurance companies are bound by regulations that prevent them from charging uh, existing customers more than new ones. There are also provisions in place to assist those struggling to cope with the financial burden of insurance costs. The stark reality is that rising insurance costs, particularly in the realm of car and home insurance, are outpacing the average inflation rate in the UK with the motor insurance annual inflation rate soaring to 43.1 per cent. Shocking exploitation. It is evident that urgent action is needed to, to address this disparity. I will just read some figures. Mr. Speaker. AIG paid out its highest dividend since 2007 this year. Allianz operating profit jumped from 5.7 per cent to 14.2 billion euros. Aviva made 715 million up 8% on the previous year. AXA up 23%. NFU 220 million in profit. Uh, QBE 475 million dollars. RSA 55 million. Zurich 1.76 billion. On the backs of ordinary people, these companies are raising uh, our insurance costs uh, and making huge profits, and they can't explain it. The only the uh, response I have had, Mr Speaker, which is shocking, is that their costs have increased, but they cannot explain it or justify it. We must ensure that the consumer is protected and that these costs are questioned, and we have a responsibility to do that. Thank you. Call Robbie Butler. 
uh, Speaker, I'd like to associate myself with the thoughts that you're passing on to the Stelford family uh, on this occasion. Uh, Christopher was indeed a, a fantastic parliamentarian, but I know as a father uh, and a dad uh, and a husband, he was uh, be also sadly missed. Um, Today we have some good news, and uh, many of you will have been aware, made aware of the, the great success at the weekend by our own Daniel Whiffen from Macrolin, where he achieved uh, quite a astounding feat over this last six days, where he's won two gold medals in the freestyle swimming, 800 metres and 1,500 metres. And I'm sure uh, each of you will want to associate yourselves with the comments that we wish him a great success in his future endeavours, whether that's in the Commonwealth Games or indeed the <laughs> Olympic Games. Um, but I was in the Lisburn Leisureplex yesterday, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I went to a birthday party for a, a six-year-old, and it was a bit crazy. There was a lot of cars there, but actually, the crowds that were there yesterday were the families, friends, and supporters of many young people who were there as part of a swimming gala. And what struck me yesterday was not just the discipline that these people, like Daniel, put themselves through to attain world champion status, but also the backroom team, maybe the mums and dads, the carers, the trainers, the coaches, and those that are there to support and champion these young people to unparalleled levels of success. The commitment that Daniel would have had to have put in over the years probably would have manifested in really early morning starts. Some of these young people are going to our swimming pools at five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, perhaps evening swims, and almost always five to six times per week. So success doesn't come without cost. It comes with commitment and it comes with support. I'd like to put down on record my thanks to those who have helped Daniel uh, succeed. He started off in, uh, I think as a young person in Lisburn Leisure Plaques, probably just with the little ducks and swans as they call them, and then moved on to, to Lurgan and then came back into the Lisburn Swimming Club in his teens and had to uh, manage his educational uh, journey with his commitment to swimming. But I think uh, we can resolutely uh, uh, support and congratulate Daniel Whiffen and the team uh, for the success that they have achieved in, in Doha and look forward to future success for Swim Ireland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise also to congratulate Daniel Whiffen and the new world champion. Uh, not only was he the 800 metres last week, but this, the, yesterday was the 1500 metres, which is an incredible achievement. As has been said, Daniel's from Marlin, which is, comes into Lagan Valley, and he started in Lisburn and, and, and now he's at university in Loughborough. I would call on the Minister for Communities. Uh, Daniel's an example of our grassroots sport, and we're calling the Ministry of Communities to, to increase that funding that is delivered to uh, on the ground to grassroots sport in general, right across the board, and also to, to take the first opportunity he has to, to speak with the Irish government, the shared island unit. Most sports, in fact, nearly all sports, are constituted on an all island basis. In fact, Daniel's from, from Ireland and, and, and representing Team Ireland and Swim Ireland in Doha at the World Championships. So the, the amount of funding that we are getting in our, in our sports clubs at grassroots level is, is less than what is happening right across this island. And we're, we're, we, we need to, to, to take that balance back up. And I would ask the minister to, to do that. But I, I want to congratulate Daniel, his family, and all those coaches and the, the staff around uh, around him that has uh, delivered this achievement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on Friday morning, I received the, the very sad and unwelcome news of the passing of Harold Dennis, without doubt, one of the brightest and most successful business people uh, Northern Ireland has ever seen. Uh, Harold declared his intentions early, finishing first across the whole island in his final exams for the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Uh, he then went on to, to become a chief executive for the first time before the age of 30, and then followed that by masterminding the incredible success story uh, that was Boxmore International. Uh, Harold was headhunted in the mid-70s to revive the fortunes of what was then the Lurgan Box Making Company Limited, which was heading for the receivership. Uh, he turned it around in rapid order. By 83, he had orchestrated a buyout. By the end of the decade, it was a public company, soon to become a darling of both the stock exchange and, indeed, the financial media. Uh, and in 2001, 25 years after he began, uh, the company was uh, a company of international renown, valued at almost £200 million, which I believe in today's money is closer to £350 million. 
Harold gave back uh, to society. He served on uh, Intertrade Ireland, the then Industrial Development Board. Uh, he was also chair for a couple of years of CBI in Northern Ireland. And many charities, far too many to mention, profited from his input and his intellect. Uh, Harold would have been 94 this Thursday, Mr. Speaker. I don't buy into the notion that he had a good innings because I think the longer somebody of that brilliance is around, uh, the harder it can become to move on uh, without them. So my condolences uh, to his family uh, and particularly to his children, Mark, Susan, Heather, John and Richard. Uh, Harold was always very encouraging to me when I worked in the private sector. He was kind, he was generous, uh, he was keen to promote and mentor the next generation. Uh, and above all, he was a fantastic critical friend. I last saw him at Christmas time and he was physically extremely frail, but mentally, oh mentally, he was still much sharper than I can ever uh, hope to be. So I will finish, Mr. Speaker, by quoting from the citation as he was awarded an honorary degree by Queen's University in 1996. And I quote, Harold has a razor sharp intellect which enables him to ask the single most important question on any topic. That was Dr. Harold Alexander Ennis OBE, a great man with a great mind who will be greatly missed. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From the outset, I suppose, could I join in the tributes that have been paid to our late colleague, uh, Christopher Stalford, on this his two-year anniversary of his tragic and sad passing. Christopher was a, a great character in this House and meant a lot to many people in this House, in particular to you, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, during your time of knowing him throughout politics. And I know there's a family hurting still, and our thoughts primarily are with him at this time. I'd also like to put on record our thoughts, indeed, with uh, the late Sidney McEldoon, who passed away in my constituency last week. Uh, Sydney was well known throughout Northern Ireland, Ireland and indeed across the world in his role as a former Grand Lecturer of the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland, tragically killed in a car accident last week. And our thoughts primarily are with his wife, Irene, who remains critical in hospital at present. Um, at the funeral yesterday, it was testimony to the character of the man when hundreds turned out from right across Northern Ireland and further afield to pay tribute to a man that gives so much to the loyal orders and indeed to Northern Ireland society. So can I, on behalf of the Democratic Unionist Party, put on record our uh, deep appreciation to all that Sydney did and indeed our thoughts and best wishes to his wife Irene as she continues to recover in this tragic time. Call Danny Donnelly. Uh, Mr Speaker, I rise today um, to highlight the concerning rise in cases of me measles across Europe, in Britain and in the Republic. The Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Dr Lorda Gagan, said it is now likely that new cases will be seen in Northern Ireland. While there have been no confirmed cases of measles in Northern Ireland since 2017, it is only a matter of time before the illness is reported here. The Department of Health and the Public Health Authority are monitoring this situation closely. Mr. Speaker, measles is not merely a minor childhood illness with a rash. It is a potentially dangerous condition that can have serious complications such as pneumonia, meningitis, blindness and seizures. It can even be fatal. And just last Thursday, it was reported that a, an adult who had contracted measles has died in a, in a hospital in the Republic. Almost 89 per cent of children in Northern Ireland have received their first MMR jab, but fewer return for the second dose, with only 85% of children fully vaccinated by five years old. The World Health Organization recommends a 95% vaccination rate to prevent outbreaks, and we are currently below that. Dr. Hans Kluge, if my pronunciation is correct, is a regional director of the World Health Organization. He said in uh, December, vaccination is the only way to protect children from this potentially dangerous disease. A public health agency vaccination catch-up campaign is now underway across Northern Ireland. First and second doses of the MMR vaccine will now be offered to anyone between the ages of 12 months and 25 years who missed getting the vaccinations the first time round. The vaccine has proven to be safe and has been used since the early 1980s. The times and locations of the clinics can be found on the Trust websites. 
Mr Speaker, vaccination saves lives, and I hope that all members across the Chamber will join me in encouraging people across Northern Ireland to make sure that they and their children are fully protected against this dangerous disease. Thank you. I call Philip McGuigan. More than a million Irish passports, both renewals and first-time applications, were issued last year. Interestingly, five of the top seven counties where first-time adult applicants uh, were made were resident in, or sorry, in 2023 were from here in the north. And uh, only Dublin had a higher number of new applications for passports than were made from counties down and Antrim. These statistics, in my opinion, make a very strong argument for a passport office to be located here in the north. And I want to commend my colleague Niall Donnelly, who has been campaigning on this issue for years and whose online petition has received uh, close to 30 si- thousand signatures by this stage. Trying to resolve passport queries on behalf of my constituents is one of the most common issues that I or my office deals with, and that is particularly the case between now and the busy summer months. As in past years, I have no doubt I will unfortunately encounter families and individuals who thought they had applied for their passports in good time, become very worried that their holiday plans will be disrupted as their departure date looms and yet no passport has arrived. And I should caveat my remarks my remarks by saying that for the vast majority of people, applying for an Irish passport is straightforward and speedy, but there is no reason why this should not be the case for everybody and for all applicants. On occasions, first-time adult and children's application passport turnaround times can be slow if issues arise. The introduction of the hub, which now allows applicants to speak to someone by phone or online, is a welcome improvement, as was extending the dedicated elected representatives or act as hub to allow MLA to check the status of applications. These are welcome improvements to the system, but still on occasions uh, constituents have cause in cases of urgency to travel to Dublin to seek appointments, to provide additional information, to speak in person to passport staff or to collect passports in advance of their travel. There should be a passport office located in the north to make this process simpler. And I would urge uh, the current Taoiseach and Tongsta to look seriously at this issue. And can call you, in conclusion, can I just uh, urge and encourage anyone this year thinking of travelling abroad to check the validity of their current passport or for first time adult or children passport applications to apply well in advance of their trips? Fair I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I associate myself with your remarks and those of others. Uh, on this, the second anniversary of the passing of Christopher Stalford. Mr. Speaker, the issue I wanted to raise is the very privileged treatment afforded to Deputy Chief Constable Mark Hamilton, in striking contrast with how he treated two junior officers under his disciplinary process. The High Court, of course, has ruled that the disciplinary process that he oversaw was unlawful and delivered that judgment with very scathing criticism of the processes. Unsurprisingly, the Police Federation, on behalf of rank and file members, passed a vote of no confidence in Mr Hamilton, who then goes on the sick, and now the policing board who failed to take any disciplinary action, who failed to hold him to any accountability, has approved his secondment, his cosy, enriching secondment to the Department of Justice. It is, Mr. Speaker, a vivid vivid illustration of a two-tier approach. Junior officers are relentlessly pursued, even unlawfully, as in this case, and the perpetrator is validated and rewarded and accommodated with a lucrative move to the Department of Justice. What a farce, Mr Speaker. No follow-up investigation into his conduct, no accountability required by the policing board. And of course, we have a parallel to some extent in the police ombudsman's office itself, where the police ombudsman continues to preside over cases 
against officers in the PSNI, herself having a relevant investigation proceeding, which seems to have been quietly forgotten, into events at her home. So the question is, why is there two, this two-tier approach? Why, for, for the high and the mighty, there's a bye-ball, there's reward, and for the lowly officer, there is total pursuit, even when it's unlawful pursuit. Uh, no further members have risen, so we'll move on to the next item of business, uh, which is a motion on committee membership. I'll ask Clark, please read the motion.